Hello and well, welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 23rd of March. Going to start off with some good news from the United States. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has published its intermediate results now. Now, we know that clinical trials have been done on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe. Uh, the United States wanted to do their own and they've included a couple of South American countries as well um, to collect data from. So let's look at this now. Now, this is at the stage of a press release at the moment. So it's always a bit frustrating. Um, you get the information kind of in dribs and drabs, really. So this is the press release. It's not a. It's not as if it's a peer-reviewed paper yet. That that will come. That will come. So basically, this is it. It's, it's a press release. Check out the website for yourself. Um, basically, all the information we now know um, definitively from the uh, from the researchers and the company is is on that is on that site. Um, so um, phase three trial. Primary efficacy endpoints seem to have been met, so it's looking good so far, and that's that link. Uh, that's that link there, and that's the link to the clinical trials page. So interim safety and efficacy analysis. Interim results, of course, are normal. It's normal to give interim results before the final trial, but the number seems to be up to thirty-two thousand four hundred and forty-nine. So this is a pretty good number. This is, these are good good trial numbers now. Of course, the trials for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine were conducted in the UK and Europe, but the United States wanted to conduct their own for FDA approval, which is, which is fine. It's taken a while, but uh, we're getting there now. Now, the, it was a two to one randomization of vaccine to placebo. In other words, they gave two people the, uh, the vaccine for one person who was in the control group. So that, that's OK. It's, it's, it just means you get more people in the vaccine group more quickly. Now, they've accrued 141 cases of symptomatic COVID-19 between the control group and the experimental group. The experimental group getting the vaccine, the control group getting the placebo. So 141 symptomatic cases. And that is enough to do a good, uh, a good interim analysis on. Th th those numbers are reasonable, comparable to what we saw in the original trials and the trials of other vaccines like the Pfizer and the, uh, the Moderna. Um, now, they're saying statistically, statistically significant vaccine efficacy of 79% at preventing symptomatic COVID-19. So what they're saying here is the 79% more infections in the placebo group compared to those that got the vaccine. But, and uh, again, this is what we've seen with the other vaccines, and this is what is so encouraging about this. They're saying 100% efficacy at preventing severe disease and hospitalizations. So it's preventing a lot of infections, which is good. But so far, it's 100% efficacy at preventing severe disease and hospitalizations. Now, to be fair, I think what it means in the vaccine group, there was a none, severe, none of these severe cases. And in the placebo group, I believe the data is not released yet, but I believe there was five in the placebo group. So the placebo group, five people got very sick and or hospitalised, the vaccine group, none. Now, it is true that that's 100% difference, um, but it may turn out with larger numbers that it's not quite 100%. But either way, this is consistent, what we've seen with, consistent with what we've seen with the other vaccines, that severe disease is prevented to a higher degree that, than, than mild disease. And in a way, this is quite acceptable. So if there's a lot of cases of very mild disease, then that's not such a, well, it's not good, but it's not such a bad thing. We'd like no disease, of course. But what we really want to do is stop people getting very sick, getting hospitalised, and of course dying. I don't want to be very sick. I don't want to be hospitalised. I don't want to die. And if the vaccine protects me against that, uh, I am in. That is for sure. Now, the vaccine efficacy was consistent across uh, ethnicity and age. We'll see a bit more on that in a minute. Um, aged over 65 and over, vaccine efficacy was actually slightly higher than in the, uh, in the combined age group. So 79 in the combined age group, 80% efficacy in the, uh, in the older age group. So again, good stuff, encouraging. And the, uh, the press release is saying the vaccine was well tolerated, which is good because, of course, we don't want to get too many after effects and we don't want uh, adverse effects from the vaccine. Uh, favourable reactogenicity and overall safety. Now, reactogenicity means the reactions that you would expect, like, like, like a sore arm or, or a slight fever or not feeling quite right for 24 hours after the sort of side effects, after effects that we know about. But they're saying it's favourable 
and they're saying overall it's safe. Independent Data Safety Monitoring Board. Data Safety Monitoring Board identifies no safety concerns. So this, these are independent outside people reviewing the data and they are saying uh, it's, uh, well, that they have no concerns, which is great. Now, they, the Data Safety Monitoring Board conducted a specific review of thrombotic events as well as cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So we've talked about this at length. There has been some cases in Europe where the vaccine, people have believed the vaccine has been associated with uh, thrombus, that's blood clots in these cerebral sinus veins that drain the brain. They take blood from the smaller blood vessels in the brain and they take the blood down to the large uh, jugular veins in the neck to go back to the heart. So given that they were warned about that from other um, possible associations, uh, they had a, a look specially that, that they actually gave that particular consideration. And they're saying cerebral vein sinus thrombosis with the assistance of an independent neurologist was uh, assessed. So that makes sense that they are aware of this uh, theoretical at least or, or possible association. And the Data Safety Monitoring Board found no increase of thrombotic events or events characterised by thrombosis, and that was in the number who actually got the vaccine of 21,583, receiving at one dose, at least one dose of the vaccine. And the specific search for uh, the, uh, the venous, uh, the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis found, found no events. So good size number, no events found, even although they were looking for it specifically. So uh, that is uh, encouraging, encouraging safety data so far. Now, um, across the ethnicities, um, there was a good range. 79% white Caucasian, 8% black uh, African-American, 4% Native American, 4% Asian, and 22% uh, were Hispanic. So uh, again, important to realise that this was conducted across a good age range, but also across a good uh, ethnicity age range. Now the vaccines in this case were given four weeks apart between the primary dose and the booster dose and there is data that shows that a longer time gap may improve the overall efficacy of the vaccine after the second dose but the protocol on this one was four, week, uh, four weeks apart so two doses administered four week intervals. But they are aware that extended intervals of up to 12 weeks have demonstrated greater efficacy in other work. And that's supported by immunogenicity data, looking at the immune reaction in the body to the vaccine. And this evidence suggests administration of the second dose with an interval, longer interval, could further increase efficacy. So what they're saying is that this is the efficacy, 79%, 79 uh, efficacy with four weeks they're saying that potentially that could be even higher with a longer time interval between the primary and the booster dose. So uh, possible benefits still to come there. Um, and, and of course, they also note that this would accelerate the number of people who can receive the first doses, as we have done in the UK. Storage and transport handling at normal refrigerated temperatures, which of course is brilliant, makes it much easier to handle transport, take to remote areas, 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, 36 to 46 degrees Fahrenheit, and it will last for at least six months under those conditions. It's an adenovirus vector vaccine, of course. So this all sounds remarkably encouraging with 30 million doses ready to go. But then something a bit strange happened just yesterday evening, just, just as far as I know, just a few hours after the announcement. And it was this um, National Institutes of Health website statement on the AstraZeneca vaccine. And, and they, they gave a statement to querying, appearing to query some of what was said. Now, from what I can gather, this is very unusual that this would happen. Um, so what they've said is, now it seems that, what, what it seems to me is this counter-argument comes to the National Institutes of Health and this National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases seems to be like a subset of this National Institutes of Health, if we can draw a couple of Venn diagrams like that, that seems to be the way it's, uh, the way it's working. 
Concern, now they're saying concerned by information released by AstraZeneca on initial data from its COVID-19 vaccine trial. AstraZeneca may have included outdated information from that trial, which may have provided and uh, an incomplete view of efficacy data. Now, as far as I can tell, it's very unusual for this sort of thing to be um, to be published. And if there were queries, you would really expect them to be done not quite in the glare of publicity like this. And of course, this has been picked up by numerous media outlets um, across the world. Of course, AstraZeneca's uh, cat counted back on this and quite a few experts have as well, because this does seem to be unusual. So quite why they've taken this tack and done it so publicly um, really is, is, a bit, is a bit strange. Food and Drug Administration and Centers for Disease Control, of course, will make the decision um, on, on giving authorization or not uh, after after thorough review of the data by independent advisory committees. So the FDA uh, independent advisory committees will decide. So um, quite why this has happened um, is is a bit is a bit strange. Is a bit strange, and I think clearly. Um, this is not going to bolster public confidence in the vaccine, which, of course, is exactly is exactly what we need. So I think we're waiting for clarification from the National Institutes of Health on that, um, because from the data we have from the press release, it's looking good. And the query here from the National Institutes of Health is about the efficacy. Um, now, presumably there they're talking about the efficacy. It's a very brief statement, so we don't really know. Um, Presumably they're talking about the efficacy in preventing systematic, uh, systemic disease, symptomatic disease rather, um, rather than preventing the severe uh, ill health. So um, really need I think they really need to clarify that statement because I don't think at the moment it's particularly helping. Anyway, there we are on that. Um, I strongly suspect that, well, AstraZeneca will be applying for emergency youth authorization pretty soon, early April probably, and then it's up to the FDA and their independent advisors whether they're going to grant that or not, given that it's been granted for the same vaccine in other parts of the world, I would expect it to be granted. That would mean 30 million vaccines uh, become available immediately. And, and of course, once the United States is vaccinated, I'm pretty sure they're going to be uh, helping others to uh, get their populations vaccinated as well. Now, I have got something else to say on uh, vaccine uh, immunisation technique, but I'm, I'm going to leave that for now. I'm going to leave that to the next video, because what I want to do is talk to uh, Sherilyn. Now, we talked to Paul. Now, but <laughs> Paul was just tremendous. He, he, he was doing voluntary work as the car park attendant, and he authorised this whole new one-way system through the doctor's surgery, got some engineering work done, got permissions from the council and streamlined the whole process. So I really, I just want to pay tribute to people like Paul and Sherilyn, as we'll hear in a minute, who are really some of the unsung heroes and heroines of this, giving up their time, using their brain, using their, their, their time, and, and just, just helping this whole vaccine rollout run smoothly. So let's go on to, uh, to Sherilyn. Uh, can we go on to Sherilyn now? I think we can. Hi, thank you so much for having me on the channel. So I am a Royal Voluntary Service COVID vaccine steward volunteer, longest job title ever, but here's my um, high-vis vest that I wear on site. It definitely does the trick of being extremely visible in all weather conditions. So my job basically involves outside and inside stewarding, although I try to go inside to avoid the cold as much as possible. So outdoors, it can be stewarding cars, um, telling people where to drive, where to park, making sure that the flow of traffic is managing as uh, smoothly as possible and then also managing the queue outside directing people where to go where to line up making sure that everyone is socially distanced and making sure that everybody who needs a special help or mobility access has been provided with that and then inside my job can involve helping patients to fill out forms um, completing like check-ins and the register and things like that and also making sure that everybody is feeling okay mentally because a lot of people are feeling 
being very nervous when they come in for their jab. They might have been shielding. They might be quite worried about how many people are going to be there. And it's our job to keep the area really sterile and clean and safe at all times and make sure that everyone's feeling good. We are really friendly. So if anyone has any questions or needs any help, we're here to help. It's what we're volunteering for. Um, at my most recent shift, which was at Leicester at the People Centre, I managed to get my uh, COVID vaccine, which was the Oxford AstraZeneca. And I was eligible because I'm a steward. So in terms of the stewarding role, it is patient facing. So we are eligible as a priority for the vaccine. Um, I'm 21. So otherwise I would have had to wait um, many, many months because I don't have any pre-existing medical conditions. But I was able to get the AstraZeneca jab. Um, it was really painless. It just felt like a little pinch in my arm. And then for a couple of days afterwards, I had quite a strong headache and like eye socket pain. I also had uh, bone pain and uh, fever and chills as well. So it wasn't the most pleasant experience, but definitely worth it to be a lot more protected. I have had COVID. I had quite a bad bout of it um, and it left me without a, any sense of smell or taste even a year after it happened. So I'm very grateful to have protection now because I would not like to go through it again, um, menial chance it may be. So I had those side effects for a couple of days and I was also very tired. And then the only thing I have now is a little bit of stiffness and an ache in my left arm where I had the vaccine. But other than that, it's been nine days since I had it and I'm feeling pretty much back to new. I feel really positive for the future and I can't wait to get my second dose in a few weeks. So that will be the best protection I can possibly get. And I'm looking forward to my next shift. Am I back? Yes, I think I am. Excellent, Sherilyn. Thank you for that. I mean, these things are also important. Cars, parking, traffic flows. You know, it's like Paul was doing, you know, things wouldn't happen smoothly without that. And as well as that, people would get a bit grumpy and, you know, and, and Sherilyn's obviously very aware of that, making sure people are in, a, in hopefully a good mood, relieving anxiety, giving mental support, things like cleaning the centre. You know, and uh, all, 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 all totally essential to, to the outflow of this uh, to the rollout of the vaccine program so great to know that people are, are voluntarily giving their time like Paul and Sherilyn to to do this um, glad you had this the first dose Sherilyn there the Oxford AstraZeneca you mentioned now um, he did have COVID last year so that could be partly why it does seem that people that have had COVID before get a more uh, more severe reaction um, and I'm glad to see that you've recovered and really hope your, ten your sense of smell and taste come back almost a year. I mean, obviously, if you can't if you can't uh, smell things properly, you can't taste things properly either. So let let's hope that comes back. Um, now, w when I was talking to Paul, I did take my mum down for, for her uh, second o Oxford AstraZeneca. With the first one, she did feel a bit ill for a couple of days. She was she was a bit knocked off for a couple of days. But the second one it's three days now and she's had no side effects whatsoever. So this does seem to be a bit of a pattern with the Oxford AstraZeneca that you feel a bit ill on the first vaccine, but hopefully not on the second. And my mother's not had no side effects, no pain, absolutely nothing. So that that's uh, that's good. And of course, our level of protection will now be building up. So uh, thanks for that report, Sherilyn. Excellent, interesting. And uh, thank you, of course, for all your voluntary work and all that you're doing. And I think we'll leave that video there for today. Thank you for watching.